much. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, even if it is some uh, unearthly hour here in, in London, but I'm very pleased to uh, be able to talk to you. I want to start with a quote. The quote goes as follows. The German persecution of the Jews seems to have no parallel in history. The tyrants of old never went so mad as Hitler seems to have gone. And he is doing it with religious zeal for he is propounding a new religion of exclusive and militant nationalism in the name of which any inhumanity becomes an act of humanity to be rewarded here and hereafter. Now, the author of these words was Mahatma Gandhi, writing just a few hours after a nationwide pogrom against the Jews in Nazi Germany, known as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Gandhi was shocked at what had happened on the night of the 9th and 10th of November, 1938. 200 synagogues were burned to the ground. Thousands of Jewish shops and homes ransacked. 30,000 sent to camps at Buchenwald, Dachau and Sachsenhausen. 100 Jews were killed. Now during Kristallnacht, Jews were trampled to death and thrown out of windows. Old age homes and orphanages were attacked and emptied in the smallest of villages. Ordinary people from all walks of life turned on their Jewish neighbors. Teachers led their pupils from the classroom to the synagogue and encouraged them to tear Torah scrolls and to play football with prayer books. The banker Emil Kramer took his own life one of several Jews who committed suicide on Kristallnacht rather than face the mob. Jewish cemeteries were desecrated in Hanover and Vienna. At Bad Sodden near Frankfurt, a Jewish hospital was closed down and the patients to, uh, left to fend for themselves. In Kapath near Potsdam, a hundred children were thrown out of a children's home. Many of them were orphans uh, who were forced to walk the streets and to find a Jewish home willing to take them in. This was the story of Kristallnacht. Many believed that they were doing the right thing, expunging the Jewish virus from the German body. I repeat what Gandhi wrote, any act of, in, uh, any act of humanity became an act of uh, inhumanity to be rewarded here and hereafter. Yet not all, all Germans approved of the pogrom. Der Schwarzer Korps, the organ of the SS, was particularly annoyed at such quiet uh, disapproval by some German citizens. It described them as a rabble worse than the Jews. The reaction of the Western powers was one of deep anger and profound outrage. US President Roosevelt said, I could scarcely believe that such things could happen in a 20th century civilization, while former President Hoover accused the Nazis of taking Ger Germany back 450 years to talk Kamada's expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Editorials in the American press were scathing, while Mayor LaGuardia of New York instructed that the police squad deputed to guard a visiting Nazi delegation should now consist only of Jews. In the British Parliament and press, there were similar expressions of outrage. The events of Kristallnacht, events which so shocked Gandhi, were a harbinger of what was to come during World War II when Nazi Germany occupied a defeated Europe. From the waters of the English Channel at Dunkirk to the snows outside Moscow, Jews were the targets of a mass murder simply because they were Jews and for no other reason. Indian forces fought courageously in World War II to defeat Nazism. The Indian army fought in Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and Algeria. It fought against the Japanese when they threatened to, to invade India. And Field Marshal Okunlech said that if it hadn't been for the Indian army, Britain would not have survived 
not only World War I, but also World War II. Now, 87,000 Indian servicemen paid with their lives to defend not only India, but the world against Nazi servitude and Japanese imperialism. When victory came in 1945, the peoples of India rejoiced. For the Jews, it was a different story. In 1939, they had no country and no armed forces. Dispersed across the world, they numbered 16 to 17 million people. By the end of the war, six million had been murdered by the Nazis, more than a third of the entire Jewish people. The Allies may have won the war, but the Jews certainly lost it. Germany had been defeated in World War I in November 1918. It had suddenly collapsed in the autumn of that year when they had a few months earlier made a breakthrough and seemingly appeared on the brink of victory. The collapse had been mainly due to the incompetence of the generals, the technical advance of the British in inventing the tank and the arrival of American troops. It was also due to the war weariness and the extreme hunger of the German people. The German monarchy fell, the Kaiser went into exile in Holland, and a republic, the Weimar Republic, declared, uh, was declared and, and the Allies imposed the Versailles Treaty. Victorious Allies stripped Germany of its many colonies and imposed harsh, harsh reparations on it. During the 1920s, Germany was in economic freefall and this became much worse with the onset of the Great Depression. Germans felt humiliated and a great resentment grew. Once Germany had been a great empire and now it had been reduced to an economic basket case. Many felt that Germany had suffered, quote, a stab in the back in 1918. If they had only kept going, German nationalists argued, they would have been victorious in World War I. All this played into the hands of militant groups which had emerged in the early 1920s, including the National Socialists of Adolf Hitler, a corporal in World War I. A scapegoat had to be found by these far-right groups a scapegoat responsible for all of Germany's ills. Hitler and others blamed the Jews for its defeat in World War I, even though tens of thousands of German Jews had fought and died for Germany. Why were the Jews hated by these embryonic fascists? Essentially because the Jews were different and it was difficult to cope with the other. Both Jesus Christ and Karl Marx were Jews, but the Jews did not fit into neither Christian doctrine nor Marxist theory. In a very important article entitled The Future of Our People, this was written in 1883 by a man called Moses Lillianbloom, he, he delineated the hopelessness of the Jewish predicament. He wrote this, the opponents of nationalism see us as uncompromising nationalists with a nationalist God and a nationalist Torah. The nationalists see us as cosmopolitans whose homeland is wherever we happen to be well off. Religious Gentiles say that we are devoid of any faith and the free thinkers among them say that we are orthodox and believe in all kinds of nonsense. The liberals say we are conservative and the conservatives call us liberal. <laughs> Some bureaucrats and writers see us as the root of anarchy, insurrection, and revolt. And the anarchists say we are capitalists, the bearers of the biblical civilization, which in their view, based on slavery and parasitism. Officialdom accuses us of circumventing the, la the laws of the land. That is, of course, the laws directed specifically against us. Musicians like Richard Wagner charges with destroying the beauty and purity of music. Even our merits are turned into shortcomings. 
Few Jews are murderers, they say, because Jews are cowards. This, however, does not prevent them from accusing us of murdering Christian children. This was, uh, this was written, as I say, nearly 140 years ago. Now, Hitler whipped up anti-Semitic feeling in Germany in the 1920s. And he came to power uh, in early uh, 1933 as chancellor. And within weeks, the first concentration camp, Dachau, had been opened to contain political opponents. A one day boycott of Jewish shops and businesses took place on the 1st of April. Stars of David were painted on shop windows and on doorways. In September 1935, the Nuremberg laws were enacted. This forbade marriage between German non-Jews and German Jews. It also stripped Jews of citizen rights. By 1939, 44% of German Jews had left the country. There was even a plan to resettle the rest of the Jewish population in Madagascar. Many German conservatives simply looked the other way and went along with Hitler's mad ideas. Many supported the enabling law of March 1933, which effectively gave Hitler full dictatorial powers. They thought that they could control Hitler. They couldn't. They thought that Hitler was a passing phenomenon. He wasn't. They believed that Hitler's brinkmanship in retrieving the territories lost in World War I would never lead to war, but it did. The historian Michael Burley, Burley in his book, Sacred Causes, encapsulated why Hitler came to power and why he appealed to many Germans in times of adversity. Burley wrote as follows. Hitler came from a humble backwater on the peripheries of an empire. The Great War was the authentic experience that emotionally connected the listless drifter with millions of ordinary Germans, who like him had also returned to the chaos and political strife of the Weimar Republic. It was a two-way process, like people trying to touch each other in a dark room. Hitler's early supporters had, quote, found their way to him. Their faith given their lives, quote, new meaning and a new goal, or something akin to the transforming experience of a religious conversion. Now, on the 1st of September, as is well known, Hitler invaded Poland. Two days later, Great Britain and France declared war on Nazi Germany. Over 3 million Jews, some 10% of the population lived in Poland in the 1930s. <clears throat> now, some 2 million Polish Jews were under German occupation. Within weeks of the invasion of Poland, its Jews were herded into ghettos where living conditions were exceedingly primitive, disease was rife, and food was scarce. By 1943, almost 300 ghettos had been established to imprison hundreds of thousands of Jews. Moreover, Germany's Hitler and the Soviet Union's Stalin had signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in the days before the invasion of Poland in 1939. This was a non-aggression agreement in which both countries agreed to divide Poland between them. Two weeks after Nazi Germany had invaded from the West, the Soviet Union invaded from the East. Poland had ceased to exist as a sovereign state. Between then and the spring of 1940, the so-called phony war prevailed. In April 1940, Norway, Denmark, Yugoslavia, and Greece were invaded. This was followed by the, invade, by the conquest of Belgium and Holland, where Anne Frank, a Jewish girl, hid in a house in Amsterdam and wrote her diary. In the summer of 1940, France fell and Britain stood alone and dependent on countries such as India, Canada and Australia. The United States remained neutral. <coughs> One year later, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941 in Operation 
Barbarossa. As the German armies advanced, the Einsatzgruppen killing squads sought out elements to murder. These included communists, the Roma, gypsies, <coughs> excuse me, and Jews. <coughs> they were often helped by nationalist co collaborators in the Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, and other countries that they conquered. At the end of September 1941, the Germans murdered over 30,000 Jews at Babi Yar, a ravine just outside Kiev in the Ukraine. The killing machine processed its victims by lining them up naked alongside a ditch they had just dug. Murdering the, this first line of victims, a second group of victims would line up at the end of the ditch. They would be murdered and fall on top of a cushion of corpses. The German executioners referred to it as sardine packing. Within weeks, the Nazi killing machine had begun to murder women and children. No one was spared. Babi Yar was symptomatic of a radical, of a gradual radicalization of Nazi extermination practice. In January 1942, 15 leading Nazis gathered at a villa in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee and planned, quote, a final solution to the Jewish problem. In ambiguous language, it stated that they would be, they were to be transported to the East. At the same time, the Nazis went beyond using mere concentration camps to contain Jews. Initially, they used to gas Jews using the exhaust fumes of vans. Then they started to expand these camps and to build extermination camps as annexes. Gas chambers were, were installed at Auschwitz, Belzec, Medianek, Sobibor, and Treblinka. Jews were brought in in sealed cattle trucks from all parts of Europe. There was a selection whereby a chosen few were selected to become slave labor. The rest were told to take off their clothes and herded into what they were told were showers. In the chambers, pellets of hydrogen cyanide, Zyklon B were added and the incarcerated Jews suffered, uh, died slowly. The mass murder of men, women, and children on an industrial scale took the lives of millions of innocents simply because they were Jews. Jewish prisoners were forced to drag out the uh, corpses and to collect any valuables such as gold teeth and rings. They cut women's hair and took any jewelry and then transferred all the bodies to the incinerators where their bodies would be turned into ash and smoke. <clears throat> By the second half of 1942, the news of this mass extermination of Jews reached London. Even as it became clear that the Germans were losing the war, the extermination of Jews continued apace and even accelerated in 1944. The first extermination camp to be liberated was Majinek by the Soviets in July, 1944. As the Third Reich <coughs> shrank in size with the Soviet armies coming from the East and the British and Americans from the West, there were forced marches of prisoners. In November, 1944, <clears throat> there were death marches from Budapest to the, to the, to the Reich's border at Hegye Shalom. Thousands of Jews, clad in light clothing and without provisions, trudged in the biting wind and rain in the full bitterness of a Hungarian winter towards the border. Men, women and children, old and young, the able and disabled, were now needed to provide the slave labor required to sustain the disintegrating Reich. 
trains were required for other purposes and thousands died where they fell. The Swedish diplomat, Raoul Wallenberg, reacted to this, station, this situation by racing with his Hungarian helpers to Hegia Shalom to rescue those Jews at the border who had survived the march. Those who possessed the Schutz Pass, the Swedish protective passport, bearing the insignia of the three crowns. In cooperation with the Red Cross, Wallenberg was able to deliver five truck roads of food and medicine. And through bluff and bravado, a disdain for the Nazis and the local Arrow Cross fascists, Wallenberg was able to save hundreds of people. As history records, his life, his, his reward was a short life and an uncertain death in one of Stalin's execution chambers. Many Germans remained diehard Nazis at the end and believed that Hitler would reverse German fortunes. Others blurred patriotism for the fatherland with loyalty to the Nazi state. Many feared the advance of the Red Army of the Russians and the revenge that the Soviets would reap. Yet this was not a normal war between sides, one the victor, the other defeated. Nazi Germany was a genocidal state. Its task was to murder all the Jews in the world. It did not succeed. In April 1945, British and American troops entered death camps such as Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, Dachau, and found the remnants of the forced marches, the dead and the dying, the emaciated and the corpses. They were horrified at such bestiality. The first film footage reached London cinemas in April and May 1945. Word passed from mouth to mouth. Huge queues formed, circling the cinema block several times. This was the first imagery of the Holocaust. In Hebrew, the Shoah, which means destruction. And audiences came out of these cinemas stunned. They were unable to contemplate the imaginable, what the Nazis had wreaked upon the Jews and upon humanity itself. So, in 2021, it is self-evident why we meet here today, albeit, for me, virtually around a computer. Myself in London and you in Delhi, um, other places, other locations in India, the universal lesson from history is that no one should be a bystander. I would like to finish with, with the words of the Italian Jewish writer, Primo Levi. He wrote this, he'd been in a camp himself, he'd survived. He wrote this in 1946. Consider that this has been, I commend these words to you. Engrave them on your hearts when you are in your house, when you walk on your way, when you go to bed, when you rise. Repeat them to your children, or may your house crumble. Disease render you powerless. Your offspring avert their faces from you. This is the lesson of the Holocaust so many years ago. Thank you.